Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all again for attending this year's Theodore Roosevelt Symposium. I am honored to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Harry Lembeck. Mr. Lembeck describes himself as a recovering lawyer with a passion for history. As a man known for his knowledge of Theodore Roosevelt and the Progressive Era, he was selected as an expert source for the PBS documentary entitled Slavery by Another Name in 2011. In 2009, he was the moderator for a symposium on TR and the Rough Riders in Tampa. Then in 2012, he was asked to moderate another symposium focusing on the progressive movement of, the 19, of 1912. Excuse me. Mr. Lembeck writes for the Theodore Roosevelt Association Journal, is an active member of the Theodore Roosevelt Association, and has been its vice president, been, its, been on its executive committee, and on its board of trustees. In January of this year, Prometheus Books published, published Mr. Lembeck's historical narrative entitled, Taking on Theodore Roosevelt, How One Senator Defied the President on Brownsville and Shook American Politics. In addition, he served on the board of directors for the Marietta Museum of History, Theater in the Square, and Bullock Hall. Mr. Lembeck was a Marine officer between 1964 and 1971, and served in the continental U.S. on Okinawa and in Vietnam. His wife, Dr. Emily Lembeck, he would like to mention, is the superintendent of schools in Marietta, Georgia. Lastly, Mr. Lembeck asked me to warn you that even though in his book, our 26th president is not necessarily the good guy, but he would like to still mention that he admires TR for what he was and what he did for our country. He still sees TR as a great, great president. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Harry Lembeck. Thank you, sir. You did great. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Cassandra. You did great, and I really appreciate it. I hope I can live up to it. I have moderated a lot of Theodore Roosevelt symposia, and I have enjoyed every one of them. And this is my first time at this symposium, and I can't tell you what a thrill it is to be invited, to be here not as someone out there only, but as a speaker. So I've jumped from the frying pan of moderating to the fire of speaking, and uh, I hope that uh, when I'm finished, you still uh, are glad that you stuck around all afternoon because we're going to talk about a Theodore Roosevelt that uh, you probably are not too aware of. In non-Theodore Roosevelt admir admiration society groups, I'll ask how many have heard of the Brownsville incident, and I sometimes get no hands. So I'll ask this group, how many have heard of the Brownsville incident before today? Well, see, this is very good. I'm really happy. This, this, this is, uh, the course, you are all TR fans and admirers. Well. In Brownsville, T.R. is not necessarily the good guy, the protagonist. In fact, he's very much the bad guy. And writing this book was, to some extent, painful for me. Because I had to write a man, about a man that I admire and respect and even love and still do. But I had to write about a mistake. It was like writing about one of my father's mistakes. And it wasn't pleasant, and, uh, but it is TR. And uh, at the end of the book, I think he comes out a little bit better than the conventional uh, opinion. But uh, before I start talking about Brownsville, I'd like to tell you about my favorite TR story. It occurred during the time of the Brownsville incident. It was in the summer. And he was at the Summer White House, which was his home, Sagamore Hill in Oyster Bay. And he was in a meeting with a lot of very important people, Secretary of State and others. And they were discussing, among other things, the simmering rebellion in Cuba. Cuba was a problem that never seemed to go away. And there was a knock on the door. And T.R. said, come in. And the head of a little boy appeared. And he said, Cousin Theodore, you promised you would play with us at 4 o'clock. And it's after 4 o'clock. And President Roosevelt said, quite right. Go back downstairs. I'll be there in five minutes. And he started to pick up his papers. And the other men in the room, and they were all men then, protested. Mr. President, we've come all the way from Washington. This is a very important meeting. Surely you're not going to end it for the sake of a 10-year-old boy. And Theodore Roosevelt said, yes, we are. You must never break your promise to a child. Now, isn't that the Theodore Roosevelt we all 
know and love? That's not the Theodore Roosevelt we're going to hear about now. As that third panel says, the third panel from the end says over there, we're going to remember Brownsville now. But we'll start with the Civil War and the Army's acceptance of black soldiers in segregated units. This is a poster from the Civil War. Actually, I'm on this microphone so I can walk. This is a poster from, from the Civil War saying, Men of color, to arms, to arms, now or never. Battles of liberty of, and the Union fail now and our race is doomed. And it goes on that way. It ends with, we appeal to you. And because of this, and because of the need for manpower, the Army accepted black soldiers in segregated units in the Union Army. Of the two million soldiers who fought for the Union, 180,000, almost 10% were black. Of these 180,000, 40,000 were killed. That's about 20%. After the Civil War, the Army kept two black cavalry units and two black infantry regiments. One of them was the 25th Infantry that we'll talk about this afternoon. In the immediate Civil War period, in the immediate post-Civil War period, the now victorious North imposed on the South what was called Reconstruction. Reconstruction was reforming the Southern states to where they could be readmitted, so to speak, back into the Union on the same equality with Northern states. Not incidentally, two other purposes of Reconstruction were to assist newly freed former slaves and punish the South. The South hated Reconstruction, but had no choice but to put up with it. But in 1876, when neither candidate had won enough electoral votes to win the election, the Democrats, the party of the South, proposed a deal. The Republican Rutherford B. Hayes would get the White House, the Occupation Army of the South would be withdrawn, and most important, the South would see the end of Reconstruction. And whites, almost all Democrats, took control of southern state legislatures and southern state governments. They legislated laws to isolate blacks and deny them political and social equality. These were called Jim Crow laws. This is a picture of Jim Crow. Jim Crow was a minstrel character that played around the South and the North in those days too in these shows, these traveling shows. The preeminent black leader at the time, Booker T. Washington, urged blacks to accommodate themselves with Jim Crow. What else can we do, he argued. And he asked whites, just leave us alone so we can prepare ourselves for equality. And so there was this tacit deal between blacks and whites, in the South especially. Blacks would be denied certain rights, such as the right to vote. They would be denied social equality. And the whites would leave them alone. During Jim Crow, black soldiers had fought in the Spanish-American War. By the way, the Black 10th Cavalry was part of the Re Roosevelt's Rough Riders Charge up San Juan Heights. And uh, they were right there at the top when the pictures were taken of, of, the, of the victorious American soldiers. And the 25th Infantry, the unit that we're talking about today, fought a blocking action at El Cane to keep Spanish soldiers there from, from reinforcing their comrades at the top of San Juan Heights. They also fought the 25th Infantry in the Philippine Insurrection, the Indian Wars out west, and they generally conducted themselves with honor. In May 1906, the 25th Infantry, excuse me, the 25th, yeah, 25th Infantry's 1st Battalion was transferred to Brownsville to replace a white infantry battalion. Brownsville was not happy to see them. The soldiers immediately suffered harassment returning from Mexico, which is right across the Rio Grande River, they were pushed into the river by, by whites. If they walked down the street and they didn't get out of the way fast enough, they were roughed up by whites. They were denied service in bars. This is treatment they were not used to, certainly not in the northwestern, uh, the northwest, the Pacific Northwest, and the Midwest, the Great Plains, right here where we're talking about. They served also at a fort in uh, North Dakota at one time. They were not used to this kind of treatment. They certainly didn't receive it overseas in the Philippines either. They were there only two weeks when on Monday morning, August 13th, the Brownsville newspaper had a story about a black soldier allegedly assaulting a white woman. 
This put the town on edge. And the mayor met with the battalion commanding officer, and they agreed to restrict the soldiers to their post until things calmed down. This is the 25th, whoop, back one, back one. <laughs> this is the 25th Infantry, and actually the same one is over there. Uh, not, not here in North Dakota, but uh, posted it at, uh, at, uh, in Montana. And these are the men who would later be, be sent to Brownsville. Now, close to midnight on August 13th, between 12 and 20 men rampaged through Brownsville, shooting indiscriminately into houses, hotels, and bars, bars being just about the only places of business open that late. And this is a photo of Brownsville taken a few years later. I'm not quite sure why I keep leaning into the microphone. I keep forgetting I don't need to. What we see here is where the fort was. When this picture was taken, it had already burned down. But you can see the town of Brownsville right across from the fort and up this street and into the town is where the shooting took place that we're going to talk about now. Most of the witnesses to the shooting said the shooters were either black or what appeared to be, to be wearing parts of soldiers' uniforms. There were fewer than 100 black residents in Brownsville and in all the surrounding Cameron County, but there were 167 black soldiers from the 25th Infantry right across the street from the shooting at nearby Fort Brown. Other than their white officers, there were no other white personnel at the fort. Something close to hysteria now gripped the city and its leaders pointing to what was for them the obvious conclusion from the witnesses' statements, the location of the shooting, asked President Roosevelt, they sent the telegram to him at Oyster Bay, Summer White House, asking him to relocate the 25th Infantry away from Brownsville. Roosevelt gave them the right answer. Not my problem, it's the Army's problem. Let them handle it. We'll see what they do first. But. The town's office, uh, town uh, officials, uh, Texan senators, Congressman John Nance Garner, who had become vice president under Frank, President Franklin Roosevelt, and he was the, the congressman from Brownsville, they continued to make the request. Roosevelt backed down. His first mistake. He ordered the 25th Infantry redeployed. There were two consequences from this mistake. He now owned the Brownsville shooting. This was now his problem, not the Army's. And secondly, by moving the soldiers out, he showed, you know, maybe they were the shooters. He had no longer was impartial. Separate Army investigations over the next couple of months agreed soldiers had been shooters, but they could not identify which ones. Neither could the Cameron County Grand Jury. Now listen to this. We're talking about South Texas. We're talking about 1906. This rough rider, uh, this, excuse me, this, this Texas Ranger, his name was McDonald, comes into town and he decides that these 12 soldiers that he picked out, no one knows how he picked them out, had shot up the town. He takes them to the, the Cameron County Grand Jury to indict them. And in 1906, South Texas, Jim Crow, Texas, they wouldn't indict the soldiers. There was such there was so little evidence that these soldiers had committed the shooting. The grand, the grand jury agreed. Yeah, we think soldiers had been shooters, but how do we know it was these 12? They would not indict them. At the same time, none of the soldiers said they knew anything about it, and none would finger any of the com their comrades as a shooter. They were accused of conducting conspiracy of silence. Now Roosevelt was angry. He, an angry, furious, fuming Theodore Roosevelt, acting as commander-in-chief, ordered that every enlisted man at Fort Brown the night of the shooting be discharged without honor. In essence, he was acting as commander-in-chief, and he was assuming authority not specifically delegated to him, but not specifically denied to him. And as we heard this morning, if it wasn't specifically denied, he thought he had the authority. He, in effect, issued an executive order throwing these soldiers out of the army. He did not give them a dishonorable discharge. We're going to see a slide in a few minutes 
uh, as a cover of a Harper's magazine showing one soldier and underneath it says dishonorably discharged. He actually gave them what was called a discharge without honor. It doesn't exist today. The difference between the two would become crucial. W.E. Du Bois, the black leader, the confrontational black leader, interestingly, before the discharges, he and all black leaders accepted the soldiers' guilt as being shooters. Everyone thought it was the soldiers. But when Roosevelt threw them out without a trial, without a court-martial of any kind, he threw out an entire battalion, every member of which fiercely denied any involvement in the shooting and any knowledge of who the shooters were, and based on evidence that at trial would be so flimsy it couldn't convince the, 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 the grand jury in Brownsville to indict them, when he would throw them out this way, this was a different kettle of fish. And to all the leaders, the black leaders and most of the whites, it smelled just as bad as a kettle of fish. A cyclone of astonishment followed. The New York Times declared Roosevelt's action unprecedented, dismissing a disgrace from the army an entire battalion of colored troops because of their failure to discuss, do I disclose, the identity of some of their number who had been guilty of violence and murder. Note the Times presumption of guilt in there of the shooting. Didn't say he threw them out because he, without any presumption, of, without any finding of guilt. He threw them out because they wouldn't tell on the others. The Times said that was what was wrong. The Times assumed that the others, some of the others, had been guilty. The Washington Post, unaware that the discharge without honor was technically not considered punishment, but rather an administrative separation from the army with no penalty. And now you can see why, and we'll see a little bit later why, Roosevelt was so careful to say this is a discharge without honor and not a dishonorable discharge. There was no punishment. But the Washington Post, not really thinking too, cl uh, uh, too, uh, too clearly about this, said, while the president's power to discharge a soldier cannot be questioned, it is not conferred for purposes of punishment. Punishment is supposed to follow a trial. The most bitter damnation came from the New York Evening World, which called it executive lynch law. Lynch was a very difficult word to use. At this time in, in the United States, in, in the early 1900s, there were over th between three and 400 black lynchings a year in the United States. So to call this a lynching was a tough thing to say. The South, as usual, marched to an off-key, different drummer. My hometown, Atlanta, German, Atlanta Journal, applauded Roosevelt for this most commendable act. Enter Ohio Senator Joseph B. Foraker. There he is. An old guard Republican who took up the soldiers' cause and persuaded the Senate to investigate the discharges. Despite his heroic effort on behalf of the soldiers, the Senate affirmed President Roosevelt's discharges. Angered at, what, at Foraker for what he did, Roosevelt now wanted to drive him out of public life. I tell you, without hesitation or qualification, Joseph Forker was an American hero. At its heart and soul, the Brownsville incident is not so much about the soldiers. The injustice there is almost presumed. The heart of the book and the, and the incident and the story is the bitter confrontation between him and President Roosevelt. It was a confrontation between two powerful men. It was a confrontation between two men for right, one was right and one was wrong, for justice when there was injustice. And anybody remember the President Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage? Profiles in Courage was about eight U.S. senators. See, there's a lot of hands. That's good. Eight U.S. senators who he said acted courageously. Profiles in Courage. Because they did what was right. Because they opposed their president. They opposed current opinion. They did what was right and suffered for it. How he ever didn't, uh, how he ever forgot about Joseph Fork, I'll never know. Uh, I hope maybe this lecture today and my book will sort of correct this injustice because I think Joseph Fork is an American hero. He's the man who took on Theodore Roosevelt, which is the title of the book. Meanwhile, while this was going on and Fork was opposing for uh, uh, Roosevelt. The reservoir of black goodwill toward Theodore Roosevelt quickly drained away, beginning with his invitation to Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House in 1901, the first time a black American ever dined at the White House with the president. 
All hopes for change had converged on Theodore Roosevelt. With him had come the hope of the, at, for the beginning at long last of equal participation in all America had to offer. Economic development, political equality, social acceptance, liberation from the isolation and humiliation of Jim Crow, a chance at education that would lift Negroes out of sharecropper poverty and indenture, and most important, the end to physical violence, even horrible death so many lived with. They all looked to Theodore Roosevelt to bring this about. Overnight, after Brownsville, after his order of discharge, Roosevelt went, went from being our friend, which is how Booker T. Washington always referred to him, to an anathema with the Negroes from now on. That's a direct quote from Booker T. Washington. In his autobiography, Washington wrote that as a consequence of this order, the song of praise of 10 millions of people were turned into a chorus of criticism and censure. W.E. Du Bois, B. W. E. B. Du Bois, who I said a moment ago believed it had been soldiers who had shot the town, said of the discharge without trial, the door once declared open, Mr. Roosevelt, by his word and deed, has slammed shut most emphatically in the black man's face. Nevertheless, convinced the shooting rampage in Brownsville was an act of lawlessness that had to be confronted and that, and that how to, he dealt with it was correct and without regard to any question of race, President Roosevelt believed he did justice. Where's Ted? Ted said he liked orderliness. And that's how he looked at things. This was disorderly. He had to get them out of the army. Now the question we have though today is, did he do what he did because the soldiers were black, buffalo soldiers, black soldiers? Would he have acted differently if they were white? And did he commit an act of injustice, an act of racial injustice? To answer this, we first have to ask, do we think Roosevelt was a racist? Pulitzer Prize winning historian David M. Kennedy has suggested Roosevelt's racial views were tainted in his youth, reinforced as a young man, and stained, stained him as president. Darwinian so notions of evolutionary progress through struggle continue to color his thinking about issues ranging from politics to warfare to racial characterization. Kennedy thought he was pretty much a racist. On the other hand, progressive era historian Sidney Milkus credits Roosevelt with freeing himself from the most noxious views of an Aryan race. And he no longer subscribed to a perverse understanding of evolution common to the, in the United States at that time that championed white supremacy. Milka says he wasn't. The best answer is really in the middle. Historian and forceful Roosevelt admirer John Gable has written, Roosevelt generally subscribed to the views of Booker T. Washington. That is, he believed that many years of educational, vocational, and self-help training for blacks would be needed before the problem facing the Negro could be solved. Thus, he did not think that the long oppressed blacks had yet reached a high enough degree of education Epic economic success and social and cultural achievement as the majority of whites had. Roosevelt's blacks as a race had to be treated as a father treats a child, with care and an awareness they possessed some rights now, but with growth and maturity, full privileges in the future. In the early 20th century, these views were not thought to be racist. And it cannot be denied that Roosevelt truly felt he was not a racist, that he did justice because these black soldiers had been involved in the shooting and that others knew who did it and did not rat on them. W. E. B. Du Bois, the man who said Roosevelt slammed the door in our face, wrote when Roosevelt died in his obituary in the magazine, The Crisis of the, the NAACP, even in our hot bitterness over the Brownsville affair, we knew that he believed he was right, and he, of all men, had to act in accordance with his beliefs. Even Du Bois, 10 years after Brownsville, gave him a pass. As a young boy, Theodore Roosevelt told his father to love justice, to be merciful. That is my religion. Those of us who were watching those slides at the lunch break, we saw him say that in different ways over and over again. As Tep President recognizing his moral responsibility, he made it clear his attitude was giving justice from above. And as a practical man, he told one of his attorneys general, we must not only do justice, but be able to show we are doing justice. After he left the White House, he testified in a civil matter, which we'll hear about tonight in the trial. He testified in a civil matter having nothing to do with Brownsville, that he thought he always dispensed justice. Always dispensed justice. 
He was asked by the other party's lawyer, how did you know that substantial justice was done in the matter at hand? Roosevelt said, because I did it. Because I was doing my best. Question, you mean to say that when you do a thing, thereby substantial justice is done? What do you think Roosevelt said? I do. When I do a thing, I do it to do substantial justice. I mean just that. But Lewis R. Holland, Booker T. Washington's biographer, pulled no punches when he called the Brownsville incident the grossest single racial injustice of that so-called progressive era. Archibald Grimke, the first black graduate of Harvard Law School, and an on-again, off-again Republican, depending on their views on, on race, and one-time Roosevelt supporter, who would not be anymore after Brownsville, told the black community of Washington, D.C., there is no precedent. The act was not warranted by law or justice, cruel in the highest degree, and a wanton abuse of executive power. We were talking last night and this morning about executive power and executive authority. A crushing injustice, crueler than death itself. He couldn't get it out of him. He kept going on and on. The blow of an old friend, and therefore the unkindest cut of all. Something one is never prepared for, and when it falls, the wound, and I love this part, the wound which it inflicts, it, the wound which it inflicts cuts deeper than flesh and blood, for the iron of it enters the soul itself. Of Senator Joseph Forker, the man who took on Theodore Roosevelt over Brownsville, a black newspaper editor who, despite holding a federal job because Roosevelt appointed him to it, referred to Justice Forker's defense of the soldiers as, I stand for justice. Of his quest on behalf of the soldiers, Senator Forker himself said, to, told the Senate, they ask no fa favors because they are Negroes, but only for justice because they are men. So the general feeling was, this was an injustice. When Brownsville was all over, Senator Shelby Cullum of Illinois, a Republican who voted to affirm what Roosevelt did, Senator Cullum said, we all knew he was wrong. We all knew he was unjust. The idea to keep in mind is to keep, to keep in mind is Roosevelt saw Brownsville as a racial, if Roosevelt saw Brownsville as a racial problem, it was a problem no different from that presented by other groups pressing themselves and what they wanted on the government. Here's how Roosevelt thought about all problems. He attacked all problems with his whole body, his whole being. Here's how he thought about black grievances. They were no different from, say, big business, high tariff senators, railroads desiring no rate regulation, cattlemen needing government land for grazing, farmers who wanted government water for irrigating, blacks asking for the elimination of Jim Crow were the same as women demanding the vote, admirals wanting bigger battleships, and Arizonans wanting statehood. He saw each expressing its grievance politically and calibrated his response according, accordingly. In the political sense, Theodore Roosevelt interpreted justice, which he said he always dispensed. He interpreted justice as something each group interpreted through a prism it ground to a precision that permitted only its interpretation to pass through. For him, justice was what had to be dispensed for the good of everyone not just for separate groups pressing for it for themselves. And what was best for everyone was the survival of the American democracy and way of life. So long as justice was applied, that survival was ensured. And the momentary disappointments and denials of this group or that were acceptable. It was the price to be paid for society all would come to agree was overall just. This, by the way, was a lesson Theodore Roosevelt learned here in his, on his ranching, during his ranching days in North Dakota. And where's Doug? Is Doug, you still here? Doug Ellison? He's here? There you go. This is what Doug was talking about this morning. A just society could not tolerate or excuse lawlessness without imperiling its own survival and the survival of justice, what Doug called frontier justice. And, we, as, and as we sit, just saw, justice is anything he did, any action he took, any favor granted, any request denied, all were just. And his discharge of the soldiers, he believed was just. In taking on Theodore Roosevelt, I have Roosevelt ponderous predicament by considering his discharge order as the best way, indeed the only way, to dispense overall justice. I have him thinking, and these are the things he said or uh, told people or wrote to people, and I've combined them into a stream of consciousness. 
what is it people want me to do? Why was nothing said after the shooting in August and only when I had issued the discharge order in November? This three-month delay shows I did not act impulsively. I waited for the results of at least five investigations. One by the Brownsville citizens, admittedly not good. The others by the armies, by the army, trustworthy. No one doubts the soldiers did it. This conspiracy of silence idea made sense. Not one alternative theory did. Every advisor I spoke to, except Booker T. Washington, counseled me to discharge the soldiers, and Washington, Washington didn't like it because of its political consequences. For him especially, I know how he thinks. Washington was Roosevelt's go-to man in the South for all federal appointments, black or white. Washington had enormous power through Theodore Roosevelt. Now he saw it slipping away from him. And he counseled, he went to the White House and he counseled Roosevelt, don't do it, don't do it. Roosevelt brushed him aside. From then on, their, their relationship was ruptured. Of course, Booker T. Washington, every bit the political thinker that Roosevelt was, Booker T. Washington immediately started cultivating William Howard Taft, who he knew would be the next president. And Taft was the one he went to. For God's sake, I'm going back to Roosevelt's stream of consciousness. For God's sake, what is the complaint? No soldier was hanged. No soldier went to jail or lost a penny of pay and allowances. None was published. They all went home to their families and a new life. Not just those truly innocent. Not just those who kept their mouths shut. Even the shooters and murderers. How could I be expected to keep murderers and those who shielded them in the army? What community would accept them at a nearby fort? What community wouldn't be afraid they would do it again? I could not try them in court. They'd be acquitted and right back in the army, and I'd be right back where I started. Why the grand, the grand jury in Brownsville would not even indict any of them. Then there's this rubbish I did it because these soldiers were Negro. They say it's a part of my new Southern strategy to snatch the South away from the Democrats by appealing to white Southerners, which is exactly what he was doing. What's so bad? Not necessarily with Brownsville, but that's what his plan was. What's so bad anyway about my plan to build the Republican Party in the South? What could be better for the South, the country, and the Negro? What have the Democrats done for them in the South or anywhere else? Why, who would ever expect any progress from a political party with creatures in it like Pitchfork Ben Tillman of South Carolina? Well, I don't allow this man to set foot in the White House, and he didn't. Pitchfork Ben Tillman probably was the most racist man ever to be in the U.S. Senate. And this is a picture of him. And if you look closely, you can see he has only one eye. The other eye he lost when he was swimming as a young boy and infection set in. And as I write in the book, with only one eye, it was as if he could see only half the world, the white half. He was the most violent, murderous, racist man ever to be in the US Senate. Anyone want to guess whose side he took in the Brownsville incident? He took the soldier's side. He hated Theodore Roosevelt more than he hated the black soldiers. That's true. But in the final vote, he argued for them. He debated for them. He, but in the final vote, he voted to affirm Theodore Roosevelt. These are the defenses that Theodore Roosevelt had kept running through his mind as he was trying to defend himself, convince himself that he did something wrong, that he dispensed justice. I said it at the begin as I said at the beginning of this talk, more than a century after the shooting, the racial element speaks for itself. And today the question, was there racial justice, is almost always answered in a negative. And T.R. is rightly condemned for what he did. His defense that the soldier's race didn't occur to him seems disingenuous. How could he not think of this? About, and how, uh, and, uh, and how, he, and, and how could he think others would not? Another of his defenses, he could keep, how could he keep murders and those who shielded them in the army, has a ring to me at least of desperation. His other defenses, the discharge were not punishment, were not just a separation from the army. That's a little too technical, I believe. You know, to believe that he didn't act politically on this and say, well, I've got to think about the black vote here is, is really to engage in folly. Because on, on Christmas Day 1906, while Brownsville was just heating up, he sent a letter to uh, Booker T. Washington. He said, uh, can you give me the names of a few first-class colored, colored men? I want to appoint them to a high governor, government office. 
And uh, he took the man that I, the, 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 the black uh, newspaper editor who, who said uh, Fork was, the, was seeking justice for our soldiers. He appointed him, he, the, he wanted to appoint him, he couldn't get it through. He wanted to appoint him the tax collector, the customs collector for the port of Cincinnati. In those days, customs collectors were paid a percentage of what they collected for the government. It was a way of making sure there was no thievery. Uh, Chester Arthur, before he became president, was the customs collector in New York. Theodore Roosevelt Sr. wanted to get that job, but he lost it to, to, uh, to Chester uh, Allen Arthur. He was the highest paid man in the US government, the customs collector in New York. So this plum of a job given to a black man was done, was contemplated, because uh, Roosevelt was thinking of the consequences with the black voters, especially in the North. Eventually, he had to give the man a job as the fourth auditor of the Navy. Pretty good job, made some money. And uh, it did not help Theodore Roosevelt with, with black voters. It was just too late. My book, Tur Turning on, Taking on Theodore Roosevelt, is more than a scholarly analysis of Theodore Roosevelt and justice as seen through the prism of the Brownsville incident. We're focusing on it because that's the topic at hand today. But the Brownsville incident was really much more. It, it began with an act of shooting. It soon became a confrontation. And it soon became, uh, it, it affected the black civil rights movement. Booker T. Washington was trying to reassert himself as a leader and retain some influence. W.E.B. Du Bois, who opposed Dick Booker T. Washington, did, did not want accommodation, wanted confrontation. He used Brownsville to become the leader of the black civil rights movement and in effect turned it around for all of history from accommodation to confrontation. William Howard Taft used it to get to the White House. All these people using Brownsville for themselves. And who do you think were forgotten? The soldiers. They never were let back in the army. Eventually, Joseph Forker, who was running for re-election to the Senate in 1908, Roosevelt, after he saw, after he won the battle of keeping the black soldiers out of the army, turned his guns on to Forker. And he did just as he wanted. He drove Forker out of public life. And as I said earlier, the, the, really the, the heart and soul of this is we see a really brutal, vicious, uh, tough, tough Theodore Roosevelt going after Joseph Foraker. He'd taken care of the soldiers, now he's going to take care of Foraker. One of the things he did, I think we have a few minutes, one of the things he did was he made a deal with, the, with the Warren, Senator Warren, Francis Warren, who was the chairman of the Senate Military Affairs Committee. Anybody know Francis Warren? Yeah, this gentleman does. His son-in-law was John Pershing, the general in World War I, the highest ranking general actually in the, World War, in the Army in, in, the, in the 20th century. He had six stars. Um, Warren, as, uh, as a, a landowner and a, and a cattleman and sheepman out in Nebraska, out in Wyoming, needed government land. He took it. There were no fences in those days. He took it. He used it. It's a common practice. He acquired titles to this land in ways not considered necessarily honest. And he got away with it. Well, unknown to Roosevelt, his own Department of the Interior and his own Attorney General were going to prosecute Warren, maybe send him to jail. When Roosevelt found this out, Roosevelt, the police commissioner we heard about, Roosevelt, the man who wanted uh, order and civility, Roosevelt said to Warren, let's see if we can make a deal. Why did he want to make a deal with Warren? Warren was chairman of the Senate Military Affairs Committee. What committee was going to hear uh, and investigate the question of Brownsville? The Senate Military Affairs Committee. Now, we don't generally think of President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, saying to a senator one step ahead of the sheriff, let's make a deal. I'll get you out of hot water if you make sure my, my uh, decision in Brownsville is, is maintained. And uh, I found in, in research at the University of Wyoming what's called, I guess, the, the smoking gun. The letter from Warren to his foreman back in, in uh, Wyoming saying, I've got it. I've got the deal. Here's what we have to do. And he lays it all out in black and white. Today, it'd be foolish to put it in writing. Although maybe put it in an email. Theodore Roosevelt was a great man and a great president. He deserves his place on Mount Rushmore. 
But some people who are great sometimes make mistakes equally as great. And in Brownsville, Theodore Roosevelt made a whopper. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate your attention. And I know I'm going to have some tough questions from Clay. But I welcome them. Uh, tonight, one of the trials of Theodore Roosevelt is about his action in Brownsville. I am going to assume the role of Senator Forker. I am going to prosecute Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, you are going to vote. I hope I've uh, uh, successfully prejudiced the jury by now in my favor. Great. Thank you very much. Question. I'll step over here. Uh, yeah. So we so appreciate that talk. That's one of the most sobering talks we've heard about Theodore Roosevelt in the whole history of the 10 years of the Roosevelt Center. And, and believe me, we don't line up people to be critical of Roosevelt. We just want people to come and talk about these incidents. If I could have reproduced his language today, I would have done so. Of course, it's in the book. Uh, there's, one, there's, one, there's one chapter devoted to his appearance one night at the Gridiron Club dinner. He was in an angry mood to begin with, which is not important for what we're talking about now. It was a Saturday night. He'd had a busy Saturday. He was angry. He goes to the Gridiron Club dinner, and he's sitting there, and he's just thumbing his, uh, tapping his thumbs and just thinking and thinking and thinking. And he looks up, and who does he see? J.P. Morgan. And for no reason, he stands up and starts screaming at J.P. Morgan, the financier, the biggest financier probably in American history. I am the only one standing between you and the mob. The people there are incredulous. They've never seen anything like this. Roosevelt is just getting, getting started. He sits down. He looks over in the other direction. Who does he see now? Forker. He stands up and he says to Forker, just, just for no reason, just impetuously, just who do you think you are opposing me? He starts to, to approach Forker. Justice Harlan of the U.S. Supreme Court, the only man to, to, uh, to, uh, vote, to, to cast a dissenting vote in Plessy versus Ferguson, which we discussed yesterday and this morning, which affirmed separate but equal, he cast a dissenting vote. He's sitting next to the president. He's physically holding him down. The president of the Gridiron Club comes over, and he's physically holding Roosevelt down. He's absolutely livid. They, can't, they can hold him down. They keep him away from, from Foraker, but, Foraker, but rest, Roosevelt won't stop. He says... The only reason I didn't hang these, these, these bloody butchers, he's talking about American soldiers, by the way, who have not been convicted of anything, or indicted. The only reason I didn't hang these bloody butchers is because I couldn't figure out which one to hang. Finally, he goes on and on, and he sits down. Now, you may all know, of course, that the protocol is, after the president speaks, no one else is allowed to. But the Gridiron Club is made up of journalists. Newspaper men. The president of the, J, of the, of the, of the uh, Gridiron Club looks over at Forker and sort of winks, nods his head. Forker, breaking protocol, steps up to address the president. His tone is entirely different from Roosevelt's. He's quiet. He defends himself. He says, I didn't come to the Senate to take orders from the president or anyone in Congress. I came here to do justice. And he goes on in this vein. And Roosevelt's getting angry and angry and jumping up again. And again, Justice Harlan pulls him down. And Forker sees that Roosevelt cannot be contained. And finally, he ends it by saying, Mr. President, I love you so. And he finally sits down. This didn't quiet Roosevelt at all. But the president of the Gridiron Club ended the dinner at this point. The Gridiron Club end, ended the Gridiron Banquet. The point I'm trying to make is, the way Roosevelt spoke out loud. Can you imagine a man, the president of the being physically held in a seat because he wanted to attack somebody? This is not your grandfather's friend, Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, it is a negative uh, thing. But, but, but um, he sometimes behaved un-Roosevelt-like. And this was one of them. So to the best of your knowledge as a historian who spent a number of years looking at this, who did the shooting on that night? We don't know, because no, we don't know. Suspicion fell on the soldiers for the reasons I told you. The, the thought was they attacked the, the city, 
for revenge for the harassment they were getting from the city. But they couldn't show anyone, show this. The next group of, uh, the next target of suspicion were the Mexicans. But Brownsville was 80% Mexican in those days. And uh, there was no reason for them to have done it. And there was no witnesses, no allegations. The other were the whites. The theory was the whites dressed themselves as soldiers, used blackface, shot up the town so that the army would get rid of the soldiers. But what they didn't count on was, what they didn't count on was, one man was killed by the shooters. Another man, a police lieutenant, was so badly wounded, his arm was amputated the next morning by the Brownsville mayor, who, by the way, was a doctor. Nobody could believe they would do this, that they would kill one of their own townspeople and kill one of their own policemen just to have these black soldiers moved. That's why Roosevelt really was so, so sure. He couldn't find any theory that made sense. One of the reasons we don't know who, anyone, who, who did it was because Theodore Roosevelt didn't have trials. If there had been trials, there would have been more investigation, more evidence. Maybe then some soldier would have cracked and said, oh, yes, we did it, we did it. Or maybe some white resident would have said, oh, wait a minute, we, we did it. The answer to the question is nobody knows. If you ask for my opinion. Your hunch. My hunch? My hunch is it may have been the soldiers because nothing else makes sense, as I say. But I don't know that. So I'm going to make this a hunch. I'd be just, if, if we found evidence tomorrow that it was the whites, I wouldn't be surprised. All right, so I, I agree with your hunch. So your hunch is that it probably was some of the black soldiers. Yes. Because there's no alternative theory that yes. doesn't have fatal problems. Yes. So if you're Roosevelt, I'm just trying to get into his mindset, and even W.E.B. Du Bois assumes that it was black soldiers. The problem is no one will crack and no one will confess. Right. So Roosevelt's view is, this is intolerable in a military situation. Right. That the, they're not just soldiers who A, B, C, and D. These are black soldiers who are behaving in a tribal way to protect themselves. Well, That's intolerable to the armed forces. Yeah, that was his, I, I, I don't, logic. Not to interrupt you, I don't think he said because they were blacks they were behaving this way. I think he was saying that these are comrades that are defending their comrades. These are soldiers that are defending their comrades. And they all agreed that they'd, they'd suffered insufferably. Uh, this harassment, and they shouldn't have to take it. And by the way, these incidents in the West were not unknown. Uh, the 10th Cavalry itself, which was the original Buffalo unit uh, in Texas, had the same problem when they, were, when they were deployed to a new town. But they handled it a bit differently. They left signs, all, written signs all over the town, do it again, and the town's in trouble. It didn't happen again. So, but there were shootings in other towns by black soldiers and white soldiers. So, for, for reasons that had sometimes had to do with harassment, sometimes had to do with dr being drunk, sometimes had to do with women, the kind of things soldiers do, at least in the Wild West. So <laughs> Maybe what? not North Dakota, but... So, so this is not unusual to say, okay, the soldiers did it. In this case, these were black soldiers who did it. To the best of your judgment as a historian, what should President Roosevelt have done? He should have court-martialed them. But I know exactly what he would say. I couldn't court-martial 100, I have to, I'd have to have 167 separate court-martials. I couldn't expect any of them to be successful. I'd be, as I said in a moment ago, I'd be right back where I started. But at least we'd have some proof. We'd have, you know, the, the, the word we hear today a lot is closure. Gee, he's got closure, I want some closure. But maybe we would have gotten some closure. As it is today, we don't know who did it, and so we have to think Roosevelt made a mistake. But he did make a mistake. There's no question about it. If we look at this from a sort of psychological point of view, Roosevelt made a decision on November 5th, 1906, to discharge without honor 167 soldiers. He made the decision earlier, but he delayed its publication until November 5th, which was election day. After election, right. So as the, as the blowback came from Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois, newspapers all over the country, and so on, why didn't Roosevelt say, public feeling is very strong here, and some of my closest friends, including Taft, think that I have gone too far in righteousness. Maybe I should pull back a little on this. Why didn't he pull back? This wasn't what Roosevelt would do. Roosevelt wouldn't pull back. He made his decision. He was going to implement it. Taft was so sure Roosevelt had made a mistake. Roosevelt, uh, the, the, the election is on Tuesday the 5th, and on the following Friday, whatever the date is, two or three days later, he leaves for Panama. 
to inspect his canal. We've all seen that picture of Roosevelt on that big derrick and all that. You know, that's, that was done on that trip. And he leaves, he figures he's left Brownsville behind him. Meanwhile, Taft, who was Secretary of War in those days, had very little to do with war or the army. He was really President Roosevelt's, I'm going to use a word, but I don't know if I should use it, a bag man for distributing federal money, mostly in the West, in Wyoming for one place, where Senator Warren was from. And, and he was more involved in the politics. He also did, I don't want, I don't want to tar Taft too, too greatly. Tar, he was also, he'd been the governor of, uh, governor, I don't know if the governor, he was the governor of the Philippines. He, he didn't want to go, but he went out there and he fell in love with the Philippines. He fell in love with the Philippine people. And when Roosevelt, when first when President McKinley, and then Roosevelt wanted to come back to Washington, he wouldn't go. He says, I've got to, I've got to finish this job here. The Philippines loved him. The Philippine people loved him. And then the only reason he came back to be Secretary of War is because Roosevelt said, well, you know, the Philippines is part of the portfolio of the War Department, so you can take care of the Philippines as Secretary of War. And, and Taft did. So he, I, Taft was not a bad man. In fact, well, I think, and I argue in the book, he's one of the most decent men ever to have been president. But, uh, and no match for Theodore Roosevelt when it got tough, though. And uh, certainly not over Brownsville. Certainly not in the 1912 election. So Taft was sure he made a mistake. What Taft does while Roosevelt is out of the country in Panama he stops the, 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 the discharges. He orders the army to stop. Roosevelt hears about this down in Panama, and he explodes. He sends not one, not two, but three telegrams to Taft back in Washington. What are you doing? When I was writing the book, you know, the funny things happen when you write books. You meet a lot of wonderful people. When I was writing the book, I received a call from a man in Illinois. He says, my father... Because see, my grandfather ran the post office, the, the, the Western Union office in, in Puerto Rico, Ponce, Puerto Rico, where Roosevelt stopped on his way back to Washington and sent one of these telegrams. And I have the original telegram that my father saved. And, and, and it's in the book. A picture of it is in my book. And as I say in the book, you can, as you read it, the anger almost bleeds through, the, Roosevelt's anger almost bleeds through the paper. But, but Taft, Taft thought Roosevelt was wrong. Roosevelt swatted him away like, <coughs> excuse me, like he was a fly. Two quick things. First, we, we want a scan of that photograph from the Theodore Roosevelt Center. You, you, I mean, of that telegram. That will be a very valuable right. document. I, I'd, I'd ask for permission for the, from, the, from the family that gave it to me, but they were very, very nice people. I'd be happy to do it. We'd I, like I, I can't imagine them saying no, but I can't speak for them. And then maybe you can write the interpretive panel for it. But say one more thing. In your book, it's, it's not central to your book, but you talk about the famous photograph of TR on San Juan Hill yes. and how it was cropped. Yes. We've all, every book you've ever read about... The, the, the Spanish-American War shows Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt, Colonel Roosevelt, and his, his uh, uh, rough riders to the left and right of him. At the top of him, Roosevelt's got his hand on his pistol, which is in his belt. We've all seen that picture. And to the right and to the left are, are, are the soldiers of the, of the rough riders. But there, were, there was more than one picture taken that day. And one of them is sort of a wide-angle picture. And if you look at that wide-angle picture, what do you see on the margins? the black soldiers of the 10th Cavalry. Now, it was told to me, and I sort of accept it given the times. I don't know if it's 100% true. But it was told to me by an authority that I respect that it was deliberately cropped to crop out the black soldiers. And then it was lost to history. Since 1898, this is the only pr picture we've seen of the, of the victorious, triumphant American soldiers on top of San Juan Heights. But there were no black soldiers. So we think, historically, there were no black soldiers there. But they were. In fact, the 25th Infantry that day, in the blocking action, lost two men were killed. Yes, ma'am. Should I be calling you? No, it's fine. So, but just say that that, you, you, that photograph has been rediscovered. Yes, it's in my book. Right. It's in the book. Go ahead. Soldiers on Kettle Hill, African American? Yes, yes, it was the 10th Cavalry, the original Buffalo soldiers. They were there. By the way, the 10th Cavalry's uh, commanding officer that day was John Pershing. Uh, yes, and there were all, and then there was a 25th Infantry just a few miles away. They were going up San Juan Heights. They were worried about the Spaniards over here. So they sent the 25th Infantry first to take care of these Spaniards so they couldn't relieve or reinforce the soldiers at the top of San Juan Heights. 
Kettle Hill, actually. There were two hills, San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill, together San Juan Heights. And um, so the 25th Infantry fought that battle. And this great scene in the book, Roosevelt is going crazy at the bottom of San Juan Hill. He's so anxious to get going. I've got to get going. I've got to get going. But he can't go till the 25th Infantry takes care of El Cane. Finally, he sees a white soldier starting up. He says, this is it. Let's go. And, this, and the charge starts. The Rough Riders, the 10th Cavalry, up they go. Jack. What's your next book? You know, I don't know yet. I'm still trying to sell this one. <laughs> but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it'll be about, uh, about Theodore Roosevelt uh, be, because I admire him too much to take, take him on again in a negative way. And, and I'm still trying to get out of my system the, the, the pain, really, that I felt portraying him this way. But, but it was the way it was. I think we have a question. One, one last question. Go ahead. Yes. 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 Any observations about TR and the progressive campaign of 1912? I think he, 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 he um, what I take out of that, I mean, he lost. And he brought in, and who won? Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was the most, if, if, if a, a pitchfork Ben Tillman was the most racist man ever to sit in the Senate, Woodrow Wilson was the most racist man ever to sit in the White House. He resegregated federal employees. He watched, uh, and he read uh, the, the Klansman, which was then became Birth of a Nation. He watched Birth of a Nation, which is a horrible movie, silent movie, uh, in the White House, and then told people they should all watch it. Great movie. He had, he had the producer, D.W. Griffith, come to the White House. He was, he was impossible. This is what President Roosevelt brought into the White House by splitting the Republican Party. Taft had more antitrust cases than Roosevelt ever did. He was a bigger trust buster. Taft was a decent man. I'm not saying he was a great president. Don't misunderstand me. But Roosevelt gained nothing for himself. He gained nothing for the Republicans. He gained nothing for the White House, except Woodrow Wilson, who, as I say, was the antithesis of Roosevelt's progressivism, certainly in terms of civil rights. The book is not a civil rights book. The book is a story about power and exercising and confrontation. The inciting incident is a civil rights incident, and the black soldiers keep reappearing as they make their case. Yeah, we've got to leave it at that, but let me say, as to Wilson, he, he would not let the 25th fight in World War I. He put them in an That's American right. command That's right. to keep them out of action. That's right. He sent, I think, to Hawaii. Exactly right. He couldn't right. get any farther away from France than Hawaii. Harry Lembeck. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.